I, I work really hard to find a title. As I know, uh, Nick gives me trouble if I don't. So how about this one for you, Nick? Are you without wax? What do you think of that for a title? Would it get you to read, a, read the book? <laughs> anyway, today we, we, we come to the fourth beatitude, which is, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That's Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. Well, today, as I've just said, we come in our series of talks on the Beatitudes, and I'm going to start by telling you a story about the Romans. Before Emperor Constantine, the Romans worshipped many gods, and it was common practice for every home to have its own statue of a god. And these statues were mostly made out of marble. And it was the business uh, for stonemasons who carved these statues out of marble to do the very best job that they could. But some masons were better and more skilled than others. For the less scrupulous, those who made mistakes and cracked the marble or chipped a bit off that they shouldn't have done. Do you know what they did? Huh? Any idea? So it could be sold? They got some wax and they filled in the cracks so that it would look perfect. I don't know if you've ever been sold something that was defective, but had been made to look fantastic. Years ago, um, I bought a car, and I had an engineer look at it, and he said, fine. But later on, it was discovered that uh, the person who sold it had filled the gearbox up with sawdust. <laughs> and I had a serious problem. But... If you had bought, because you, everywhere you went, you could see these statues of Roman gods for sale. And that was fine. People thought they would get, get away with how they'd covered up their mistakes. Well, it was okay on cold days. But when the sun came out, and believe me, it was hot in those days, <laughs> what happened? The, mac, the wax melted. And so it would reveal the cracks. And this is where we get our word sincerity from. Sincera, which means without cracks. This beatitude says that only the pure in heart will see God. I wonder just how many of us are without cracks. Almost since the dawn of time, there are records pretending to, of people pretending to be what they're not. Do you remember the story in Genesis 27 where Jacob gets Isaac's blessing instead of his brother Esau? That was an early account of deception. Do you remember he'd covered himself with animal skins? and made himself to look and feel like his brother. And of course his father was blind and didn't realise he'd been deceived. I wonder how many of you ever watch Bargain Hunt or the Antiques Roadshow. One of the first things the experts do is to see if the goods are genuine antiques or just modern replicas. Is the item in good condition or has it been restored? That piece of Minton, is that genuine? And what they do is they get their teeth and look like they're going to eat it to see if it has been filled or repaired. 
Is the jewellery hallmarked? Is it nine carat or 14 carat gold? The silver, is it pure silver? Or is it just silver plated? And actually, how much silver content is there in it? Um, overseas, they don't have the same qualities as we have in the UK. And they, experts perform all kinds of tests to ascertain how authentic the item is which they're consider considering purchasing. I think we all have sadly met people who claim to be Christians, but if you were to examine their lives, they would not have any of the hallmark signs of being genuine. You see, long ago, there were lots of fakes, and that led to the history of hallmarking. And when you saw the hallmark, you knew it was genuine. What are the hallmarks for Christians? Do we have them? Or are we counterfeit? Are we pretending to be something that we're not? At first glance, you would think this fourth, the attitude, would be easy to understand. But to start with, why does it say that only those who have pure hearts will see God? One of the commonest errors made by man is perhaps illustrated in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, a passage that we read before the sermon. But I'm just going to read that verse again to you. And if you haven't underlined it in your Bible, you should. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We don't see God as we look in the wrong way so often. We also make the mistake of thinking that God loves rituals in religion when God simply asks of us the love and the obedience of the heart. And we seek to put him off with the observance of a number of religious forms. The Jews in the Old Testament were constantly losing sight of the spiritual nature of religion and identifying it with scrupulous observances of sacrifice and fast and prayer as prescribed by the law. Prophet after prophet brought the charge against them that they were hypocrites, mere actors and murmurers, observing the forms of godliness, but denying God's power. The inner reality was constantly being sacrificed and lost in the emphasis laid upon outward form. This verse from Matthew 15 and verse 8 makes this clear. These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. I wonder how many of us today would sell our shirts, as it were, if we were able to gain this blessing. Sadly, there's a deep desire Surely there's a deep desire in all of us to see God. In the book of Psalms, we read this lovely verse in Psalm 42 and verse 1. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you. I think there's a modern chorus with those words. And again, in, psalm, in the same psalm in verse 2, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? This is 
the supreme dream. This is the gift of gifts. This is the blessing which fills and satisfies the soul. This is the pearl of great price, which, it is, which is worth a man's time to sell all that he has in order to possess. The vision of the holy and blessed God. If we look back over the blessings promised in the other Beatitudes, we feel that we want them all. Well, I know I do. How about you? We want the kingdom of heaven promised to the poor in spirit, the comfort promised to the mourner, the inheritance of the earth promised to the meek, the satisfaction promised to the hungry, the mercy promised to the merciful. But surely this is what we want most of all. We want to see God. Anyone here want to see God? What an amazing thing. What a sight. I think it's impossible for us to perceive God because he is so holy. Oh, but isn't that the desire? Surely it should be the desire for us all. There's a rather a nice Welsh proverb that I like which says, without God, without anything, with God, enough. Doesn't that say it all? We have nothing unless we have God. You can have the whole world. But if you have Christ, don't have Christ, you have nothing. Without God, without anything, without this blessing, without this blessing, without any blessing, without the vision of God, without comfort, without satisfaction, without mercy, without hope of heaven. But with God, enough. Every other blessing is included in this one. Comfort is mine. Satisfaction is mine. Mercy is mine. Earth is mine. Heaven is mine. If only I can see God. Of all the blessings promised, this is the blessing I crave and covet the most. And for this blessing, all of us seek. Here are just a few verses from the Bible. Genesis 32 and 29. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. Exodus 33 and verse 18. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And no, Moses, of course, was a friend of God. And what about Job 23 and verse 3? Oh, that I might know where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. This was cried by the stricken Job when he was in the ash heap. Do we not cry that? Oh, that I might find him. And the psalmist elsewhere says, God, show yourself. Isn't that on our prayers? That we have difficulties and trials? God, show yourself. This surely is a universal desire. You might recall that we read that when St. Paul was in Athens... He found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. That's in Acts 17 and verse 23. Surely this is a rather pathetic witness to the hunger of the heart for God. For all over the world there have been temples built to unknown gods. Which is just further proof that deeper than any other desires in the human race is the desire to see God. So in some way our happiness depends on knowing God. 
Do you remember the story of Simeon in the temple? If you were an Anglican, you would have heard of the nunc dimittis, which is said every single Sunday, or it used to be, and is actually found in St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, and verses 29 and 30. I'm sure you know it, but let me remind you. Lord, now let us, thou thy servant, depart in peace according to thy word, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. Do you remember those words? Wonderful, aren't they? Simeon had nothing left to wish for as his every desire had been fulfilled. His cup was running over. He had seen God. Yes, this is what we all want. For this, we would give almost anything. For this, we would make sacrifices. For what is wealth or earthly pleasure compared to this? All this would be ours if this were ours. This world would be joy. This would be peace. This would be perfect bliss. This would be heaven itself. To see God. What about these words in John 17 and verse 3? Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The vision of seeing God is promised to all who have a pure heart. But this is where the problems lie. How many of us have a pure heart or have a heart without wax? The heart is the organ for spiritual vision. And it is our forgetfulness of this fact that has led so many into mazes of difficulty and doubt. They've expected to discover God, to see him by means of the senses and the intellect. But God is a spirit, so we're not going to discover him by using our senses. The geologist might take his hammer and examine the rocks. The astronomer may take his telescope and sweep the heavens. And the chemist may take his crucible and his scales and test the elements out of which the earth and sea are formed. But neither the ge geologist's hammer, nor the astronomer's telescope, nor the chemist's crucible will ever discover God. In fact, over the centuries, men and women have reported that they have searched for God everywhere and have failed to find him. The problem has been that they've been trying to discover him through their senses, when God can only be seen and known by the heart. Another mistake many have made over the years is that they've tried to discover God by merely using their intellect. Step by step, when we try to account for things, we're driven back to the statement found in the Bible. In the beginning, God. Where do we find that? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It's fundamental. In the beginning, God. Very few come to know God just by using the human intellect as the things of God are spiritually discerned and the heart is the organ of spiritual vision. And as so often happens, that when it is hidden from the wise and prudent, it is often revealed to babies. I remember when I was at college and we went to a Bible study, all the guys would come with armfuls of concordances and versions of the Bible. And our Christian sisters would come and get to the heart of the matter. 
because they have something called feminine intuition. I get into trouble for that. But so often people see things differently. We just can't understand God theologically. But it is not even every heart that sees God. For that to happen, the heart has to be in the right condition. The Bible gives us the example of the eye. In Matthew 6 and verse 22, we read, The eye is the lamp of the body. If the eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. I don't think that I need to remind you that the eye is one of the most delicate organs in the body. And there are many things that can happen to impair and even destroy our sight. We're reminded in Psalm 135 and verse 16. They have mouths that cannot speak, eyes that cannot see. And the heart, before it can see, must be in the right condition. It must be stainless and pure and clean. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The Bible insists upon this condition. Again, in the book of Psalms, as we read in Psalm 24 and verse 3, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? And the answer is given in verse 4. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. Without holiness, says the writer to the Hebrews, no man can see God. That concludes women as well, by the way. But the heart is as a delicate organ as the eye. And it is as easy, if not considerably easier, to damage as it is to impair the vision of the eye. For example, an evil thought, or a sinful wish, or an impure thought, is more than enough to destroy the purity of the heart. And according to this beatitude, it is only those with a pure heart that will see God. I wonder if any of you can remember the story told by Tennyson of the Holy Grail. In it, many knights had set out in the quest of that holy cup, the one that is reputedly used by our Lord to have drunk from during the Last Supper. Amongst the lists of knights were Sir Lancelot, and Sir Galahad. Sir Lancelot was reputedly considered to be the bravest knight in all of King Arthur's court. But sadly, beneath his armour, he had a soiled heart, which had, sta- which had been stained by an unholy passion. And he sought to have a pure heart in vain. But Sir Galahad was a young knight and his heart was still pure and he was able to see the Holy Grail. Now this is only an allegory but it surely illustrates the old truth that the pure in heart can see but the penalty of sin is blindness. Sin in the heart obscures our spiritual vision just like the clouds that hide us from the light of the sun. This is the most terrible result of sin. We lose sight of God. We live in a world that's soaked with sin. Is it any wonder that our churches are empty? Because people have lost sight of the Holy One. Here are a few examples from the Bible that illustrate this. For example, what about the story of Cain who killed his brother? 
The punishment which followed was so terrible that Cain cried out that his punishment was greater than he could bear. And he was excluded from God's presence. Later in the Old Testament, we read that Israel fell into gross sexual sin. During the days of Eli, and as a result of this, they had no vision of God. Later, we read that Samson lay like a fool in the lap of a traitress, Delilah. And as a fatal consequence of this, the Lord departed from him. We also have the sad account of King David, the most wonderful king the Jews ever had, lusting after Bathsheba, which ultimately led to murder and to adultery. For the rest of his life, David was haunted by the ghost of Uriah, who he had murdered. Even today, many falsely think they can read debasing books, watch pornographic films, commit adultery without being the worse for it. But the penalty of this is sure, certain and inevitable. And the penalty is spiritual blindness. The sinful heart is blind. It is only the pure heart that see, can see God. I wonder how many of us today are without wax. Now the conditions of the other Beatitudes to receive the promised blessings may seem hard enough, but at least they were not impossible. But as for keeping a pure heart, this seems to be totally impossible, for our hearts are not pure. When I look within mine, I'm filled with terror. Pick out for me all the strong words used in the Bible about depravity and utter corruption of the human heart. And sadly, I know them all to be true. How do you feel about that? I know that according to Scripture, all our righteousness is seen by God as filthy rags. I heard a story some time ago about the children who lived in Verona who would like to cry after they'd seen Dante with his solemn and tragic, fig, tragic face. There goes the man, they would say, who has seen hell. They certainly spoke the truth. But the hell which Dante had seen was the hell in his own heart. He looked into his own heart and wrote the sins and crimes and passions and lusts he describes in his great and somber poem were the sins and crimes and passions and lusts he had seen in his own soul. And Dante walked through life with an awed and terror-stricken face. He'd seen hell. He'd looked into his own wicked and corrupt heart. I wonder what you will see today if you dare look within your own heart. Mm -hmm. Who was it in the New Testament said, Depart from me, O Lord, for I'm a sinner. The closer you get to God, the more your sin is revealed. Will you see the same terrible sight Dante saw? Yes, they are all within every human heart. But it's only those who are pure in heart that will see God. But please say hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, here. But thank God we need not leave it there. For we are told in Scripture that the blood of Jesus Christ has the power to cleanse us from all these sins. He can give us a new heart 
He can renew a right spirit within us. He can remove passion and lust and sin and restore to us the lost vision and enable us to see God. Yes, this blessing is after all available for you and for me today. Jesus can restore our purity and will it restore our vision. This blessing, this supreme blessing is available to all of us. May we see God. I wear glasses. My sight is defective. But I cry that I might see God. Might I see God here in this ancient chapel today? But do you desire this blessing? If you do, place yourself in the hands of Jesus. And as he cleanses your heart and purifies your soul, you will see God more clearly and more plainly every day. Here we see through a glass darkly, we're told, but then face to face, and that is heaven, to see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Can we say amen to that?